what I want to do is provide some examples of some of these travelers' tales that were created and passed along uh, throughout Europe and more specifically in England before the transatlantic slave trade. Now, there were English travelers who were going around and they were creating these myths and making these outlandish claims about the people that they uh, encountered. And the claims that they made uh, had serious effects and still impact the world that we live in today. Right. And so in going over these travelers tales, I want to go into this article here. It's called Before Othello, Elizabeth and Representation of Sub-Saharan Africans by Dr. Alden Vaughan, who is an emeritus professor at Columbia University. And it's also by Dr. Virginia Vaughan, who was a professor at Clark University. Right. So let's go in here and start reading and let's see if we can get some understanding. Othello's yarns are symptomatic of the traveler's tales that circulated in England during the second half of the 16th century and beyond. Narratives that ranged from mythical accounts of monstrous races and imaginary places to fact-filled reports of actual strangers and their remarkable homelands. Right, so these traveler's tales, as the doctors mentioned, they are filled with mythical accounts and monstrous races and imaginary places that didn't even exist. Right, and so these are coming from these travelers who are writing these accounts. And what we're going to see is how foolish many of these accounts are as we continue reading, especially looking back in today's time. Right, and so many of these accounts, they circulated throughout England, and these are like the gospels to them at this time. Right, they were eating this stuff up like candy. Right, so let's continue going. Circulating in various written forms, and to a lesser extent, in visual embodiments on stages, in public pageants, and occasionally in graphic arts. Such representations fashioned in many English minds a host of exotic others, the distant denizens of Asia, Africa, and the Americas. So some of these mythical accounts, they shaped the minds of the English, right? They planted seeds in the minds of the English, and eventually as they continued to ponder upon those seeds, they began to sprout and develop into fully mature ideas, right? And they had these ideas about all the other people who inhabit the rest of the world. And just pay attention because we're going to go more specifically in to the ideas and myths that they created about the people who inhabited the sub-Saharan African region. But as this essay will show, representations of sub-Saharan Africans circulating in Elizabethan England generally focused on difference, implying their natural inferior and non-assimilability into English notions of civility and proper appearance. And so these mythical accounts that were claimed about the people who inhabited the sub-Saharan um, region of Africa focused heavily on all the aspects that could be justified in claiming that these people were inferior, right? And so in other words, if it were anything that was against what the English thought in their imagination to be the standard of whatever it is, culture, skin color, anything against that, they would claim that that was inferior, right? And that would be looked at as in that manner and in that light, right? Let's continue going. The sub-Saharan Africans, black skin. Let's stop right here. Notice that the professors put in their quotations around the word black. Why is that? Because like Dr. Winthrop D. Jordan said in the book White Over Black on page five, that when the travelers went over there, they started making these exaggerated claims saying that they saw people with black skin, right? And anyone who knows their colors and has a good set of eyes, they can clearly see that those people do not have black skin, right? And so when I'm going over these accounts and I'm looking at some of these claims and these, these uh, tales that the people are, are, are making up, it's inclining me to believe that there's a possibility that many of these travelers were either high on drugs, they're uh, drunk off drink, they're hallucinating, um, they're doing this stuff on purpose or they just do not have the proper education on what the actual colors are, right? And it can be a combination of any one of these um, reasons as well. So we can see here clearly that the professors that are writing this article, they understand to put it in quotations, at least in this initial part, because it's an exaggerated term, right? It's something that does not exist. The sub-Saharan Africans' black skin and drastically unfamiliar customs and convictions, the evidence suggests set them apart in English eyes and imaginations as a special category of humankind. So it's saying the color of the skin and the differences of the culture is what set them apart in the English eyes and imagination that made them believe that these people are of some different type of human, right? And this is one of the reasons why we continue going over the world of imagination, right? It's extremely important. It's the foundation here to the physical world. It's the keys to it. 
right? And so whatever someone believes in their imagination has effects down here in the physical plane of existence, right? So in this case, because the English believed in their imagination that there was something wrong with the color of the skin of the African people and also the customs of the African people, that belief in their imagination had actual long lasting effects here in the actual physical world, right? This is how this stuff works, right? And many people are still feeling the impacts of that imaginary belief all the way up until today, right? The English believed these things to be true, that these were a different set of humans, right? And we know today that that is not the case. That's untrue, right? But those beliefs still had effects in the physical world, right? Let's continue going. Supplementing the classical text was a disparate array of pilgrims' narratives and travelers' tales, most notably the 14th century travels of Sir John Mandeville. Now, Sir John Mandeville is said to be a pseudonym or a fake name for the actual person who wrote many of these popular myths that we're going to get ready to read more into. Mandeville's book, which now seems incredibly naive and lightly grounded in geographic and ethnographic reality, was for several centuries taken literally. Now, in today's time, with the proper set of eyes, we can look back at many of these claims, which you're going to see are crazy and outlandish. We can look back and clearly see these things are madness, right? They're foolish, right? But the part that I want to stress is that the people in England took these accounts to be literal, right? This was 100% truth in their worldview, right? The way that they saw the world, these accounts, these mad accounts that we're going to read, this is what they believe to be the real deal holy field. Right, so watch this. It shaped the expectations of many early explorers, including Columbus in the 1490s and Martin Frobisher in the 1570s, and reached a wide popular audience. It says it shaped the expectation. What's the it that's doing the shaping of the expectation? We're talking about Sir John Mandeville's documents that he's leaving behind, these popular myths that he's creating and giving to the English population. Right, many of these accounts, they go on to also influence people like Columbus who went over here to the Americas, right? He had many of these seeded ideas and these accounts in his mind when he came over and we know exactly what happened when he came over, right? Death and destruction, right? From these beliefs that we now look back at and see as foolish. Let's continue going. The travel circulated at first in manuscript, then in several continental editions. By 1496, it was among the earliest English imprints. 68 woodcuts in the second English edition, 1499, gave readers and illiterate browsers alike a graphic introduction to remarkable creatures and places. So even if someone was illiterate, they couldn't read, they had woodcuts, which were something that was able to be used to make imprints, right? And they can create uh, pictures and like book illustrations for what it is that they're trying to convey. Right, the message that they're trying to deliver, right? Pass them all out. Everyone see these creatures and these places that we have discovered, right? This is what's going on at this time. Mandeville's description of Ethiopians illustrates the contradictory and often warped information about Africa that reached English readers in the late 15th century and beyond. Uh-oh, here we go. Let's buckle up our seatbelts right now and let's get ready to take a ride. We're getting ready to find out the warped information, the hallucinated information that these people are creating about the sub-Saharan Africans. Watch this. Let's see what's first on the list. In this land on the south are the folk right black, Mandeville reported. This is the first warped information that's being passed on by Mandeville, right? He's reporting that he's seeing people in the sub-Saharan land of Africa as having black skin, right? This is absolutely madness. Right. We already know this. This is absolutely ridiculous that people are walking around that have actual black skin. Right. And if this is not madness enough. Right. It's going to get even crazier as we continue reading this account that they're creating and spreading all throughout England. Right. And the people are taking literally to be the truth. In Ethiopia are such men that have but one foot and they go so fast that it is a great marvel. You see how foolish this stuff is? You have Sir John Mandeville who's making claims that he's seeing people in Africa who have black skin, who are running super fast, and they only have one foot. Right? This stuff is absolute madness, man. This is comic book talk here. Right? This is Fantastic Four talk. Right? And so this is the information that was being passed on to the English readers, and this is what they were taking literally. 
right? I can see them at the fire right now, sitting around it, talking about all these wonderful creatures out there who have black skin running super fast on one foot. Right? This is what's happening at this time. But it gets even wilder, right? It's going to keep going. And that is a large foot that the shadow thereof covereth the body from sun or rain when they lie upon their backs. So the foot of these people that are supposed to have black skin is so large that when they lie down on their back, it provides protection from the sun and the rain. Right? This is madness here. Right? This is the talk of someone who's hallucinating. Someone who's taken ayahuasca or on some type of mushrooms. Right? They're seeing things that are not there. Right? Or they're creating it in accounts that don't exist. Right? And once again, these are the accounts that people are bringing back. They're taking in in England and they're taking this stuff literally. Right? Believing it to actually exist. Along the lines with Bigfoot, vampires, Leviathan, Chupacabras. Right? The werewolves. Along these type of lines. Right? Let's continue going because it still gets wild. And when their children are first born, they look like russet. And when they wax old, then they be all black. So he's hallucinating or he's imagining that he's seeing babies come out as the color russet, which is this right here. And as they grow up and they become these old folks, all of a sudden they morph into something that's absolutely black. Right? This is absolutely madness. And we can clearly see this. Right? These are the accounts that are being passed on at that time. And people had taken this to be the literal truth, 100% unchangeable truth. And these beliefs that we're seeing here, these are seeds that were planted in the colonizers, right? And eventually began to germinate to the way that they introduced the worldview to the rest of the world, right? Through these types of lenses, right? Madness, right? So it's important to understand this type of history because when we go back and start looking at it, we can start to see how foolish this stuff is, and then you can start to understand it for what it is, and when you understand it for what it is, you can start detaching yourself from many of these ideas, right? And some of these ideas still pervade throughout the society today, right? Still people imagine themselves to be actual black people, right? And we can see that this is where these accounts are coming from, making up wild accounts and creating events that never happened, right? Creating descriptions of people that never existed, right? Ethiopians running around so fast with only one foot, Right? Feet so big that when they lie down on their back, it's protecting them from the sun and rain. Right? This is, come on, this, this, is, <laughs> this stuff is wild out here. Right? So this is something for everyone to take in, think about, ponder upon, right? And just consider some things. Right? And there's a whole bunch more of these mythological accounts. Right? And we'll go over more of these in other videos. Right? And these are setting the tone for some of these ideas that we have come upon today. Right, so I want to thank you for watching the video. Uh, my name is Brooklyn St. Michael, and I'll see you on the next one.